All throughout the world, people have been ringing in the new year with all sorts of superstitious traditions. Uh, for example, uh, you might not know this, but in the Philippines, uh, many people consume round fruits, such as grapes, and they wear clothing with round shapes, such as polka dots. And one reason why is because they believe that the round shape resembles the roundness of coins. And with that, they're hoping that eating round shapes and wearing clothing with round you know, o- objects that might bring them more coinage this year, or in other words, that they might uh, experience more prosperity, uh, financially speaking. In South America, many residents wear brightly colored underpants. That's right, those who wear red underpants are hoping to fall in love in the new year. And those who choose to wear yellow underwear, are, you know, they're, they're, they're wishing for more money. Some were wearing yellow underwear before the new year, but uh, that's another issue. In Denmark, many Danish, they leap off chairs at midnight, hoping to ban all bad spirits in the new year. And not only that, but they also, uh, you know, have a very loud and destructive way of celebrating the new year. They break dishes on New Year's Eve. And one way they do this is by throwing their old dishes at the doors of their friends' houses. Now, now think about this for a moment, because according to them, the person who has the most dishes outside of, uh, of their house is believed to have the most friends. And with friends like these, you know. <laughs> In Spain, many Spaniards consume 12 grapes at midnight, and they, and they try to guarantee a lucky new year by consuming all of the grapes before the clock stops chiming. Of course, this doesn't work for those who choke on the grapes, but uh, that's an that's issue for the hospitals there. But in Puerto Rico, they, uh, the locals throw buckets of water out the window on New Year's Eve, and, and this in an attempt to clean out the old year. They also clean their homes and decorate them as it's supposed to symbolize the cleaning of the spirit. And as we consider these uh, superstitions that are uh, practiced around the world, uh, you know, we might think, well, these are silly superstitions, and, 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 you know, we don't really believe in these sorts of things. Well, that is unless you grew up in the South. If you grew up in the South here in America, then you probably uh, were taught that uh, you can uh, make sure to have uh, luck in the new year by eating black-eyed peas. Uh, chances are some of us have spent many uh, you know, New Year's days <laughs> eating black-eyed peas. And, and you recognize at this point in your life, it didn't bring uh, you know, good luck. It just brought bad breath. That's all, that's all it does. But yeah, there are those here in America who think eating black-eyed peas is the key to prosperity because, you know, the, the, the peas swell when they're cooking. And, and, and so, uh, you know, maybe it, 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 it's an increase of, of prosperity for you. And, and other, others of us just recognize that there's no magic in black-eyed peas, not even the band. But, uh, but, but without debate, listen, <laughs> New Year's Day is that time of year when we all feel a little more hope than the rest of the year, right? We, we, all, we all have the hope of, of having a brand new start. You know, we got it wrong last year, and, and now with this new year, we have a new start, there's new hope. And, and, and while we probably don't believe in magic beans or lucky grapes or these sorts of superstitious things, uh, the chances are we are hoping that the new year will bring new opportunities for personal change and, and maybe for some more financial prosperity and just a better year than we had last year. How could it get any worse, Amen. But before you begin to make a bunch of New Year's resolutions, hoping that, well, this, you know, these resolutions will you know, solve all my problems, but before you go cook up a pot of black-eyed peas or wear yellow undergarments, uh, we ought to just take some time to consider what the Bible says about the new and improved life that we're really hoping to experience this year. This morning, we're going to kick off this new year by exploring what the Bible says about uh, what it means to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And as we begin to make our way through the text before us today, we're going to discover three benefits of becoming new creations in Christ. We'll see, first of all, that those who are new creations in Christ Jesus will have a new disposition. Uh, Secondly, we'll see that those who are new creations in Christ Jesus will also have a new direction. Uh, Thirdly and finally, we'll see that those who are new creations in Christ We'll have a new destination. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here we find Paul. He's writing about the new disposition that every Christian ought to have. And as you make your way to the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, I should take a moment to point out that the word disposition 
It refers to the predominant or prevailing tendency of a person's mental mood or emotional outlook on things. And, and our disposition has everything to do with the essential quality of one's nature. And, and that's important to understand because, listen, we were all born with a sinful nature. You might not know that. We were all born with a sinful nature. Therefore, we all have a disposition towards sinful things. Therefore, if you really want to turn over a new leaf this year, we must choose to live according to a new disposition, which is only received in Christ Jesus. And that's exactly the point that Paul is making here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As a matter of fact, look with me there at verse 17. <clears throat> here Paul declares, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now here in this verse, Paul is helping us to see how, how those in Christ Jesus have become new creations. And in order to better understand what he meant, uh, I want to take a moment to consider that word creation. Uh, according to Thayer's lexicon, the word creation in this context, <clears throat> it, refer, it refers to the man uh, who has actually been regenerated in Christ Jesus. You know, it, it's, it's somebody that has a new disposition. It's for this reason that the translators of the New Living Translation, they render the verse in this way, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. A new person. In Christ Jesus, we become new people. And, and then the translation goes on in, in this way, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. From this, we can see that every person has the same opportunity of enjoying brand new personhood. Isn't that incredible? We may have been born with a sinful nature and a sinful disposition, but in Christ Jesus, we have the opportunity to be a new person with a new disposition. And as we consider this promise that the Lord was presenting through the pen of Paul, I want to point out how, uh, you know, New Year's Day is always that time of year when we begin to contemplate uh, the sort of person that we've already become. You know, we kind of take a, a, a you know, a, an assessment of, where we are, you know, in our life and, and, and where we've come from and, 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 how, and how we're going to move forward. We want to we wanna consider how, how can we be a better us at the end of this year. And so that's why we begin to make these resolutions. You know, we make uh, New Year's resolutions in an attempt to become the people that we want to become. Some of us, you know, are determined to read more books this year. Others of us are determined to eat less bad food. Some of us have resolved to exercise more or maybe watch less Netflix. Unfortunately, many of us will fail, and most of us will fail to keep the life-changing resolutions that we've already made this year. As a matter of fact, according to one report, four out of five people who make New Year's resolutions will eventually break them. If you made New Year's resolutions on the 1st, the odds are against you in keeping them. One third of us won't even make it past January. Another third of us have already broken the resolution. We didn't make it past day two. You know, that pie was just there and, and you know, I was determined to not eat it, but uh, <laughs> that pie ain't gonna eat itself, right? So. You know, that Netflix is going to watch itself. And, and so we're so quick to break our resolution because it's so easy to, to just fall back into old bad habits. I'm guessing that there's many of us who don't even make resolutions anymore because why? We know we're not going to keep them. Why, why pretend anymore, right? Listen, if you truly want to experience a changed life in this new year, it's important to remember that there's only one lasting way to enjoy the new disposition that we've been given in Christ Jesus. If you would look with me again there at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to consider the secret here, which is found in verse 17. Here Paul declares, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, listen, uh, Paul here is quite clear that those who want to gain a new disposition must first beware in Christ. In Christ, we are a new creation. In Christ, old things have passed away. In Christ, all things have become new. It's not about the year that we're living in. 
It's about being in Christ. In Christ, we are new creations. In Christ, we have a new disposition. Those who want to change life must first place their faith in Jesus Christ, and we must be spiritually sealed into Christ, spiritually speaking, so that the Lord can then begin to change our disposition. Simply put, those who want to become new creations must first become born-again believers who have received the mercy and grace of God by faith in the cross of Jesus Christ. Then we must not only trust in Jesus Christ and be saved, but we must begin to then walk in the power of Jesus Christ so that we can develop a new disposition. In order to uh, prove my point, if you would turn with me to to the book of Colossians, I'd like you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. And as you turn to Colossians chapter 2, I want to take a moment to consider the the reason for why the lives of so many Christians don't actually change. Many come to faith in Jesus Christ. Many become born-again believers, and yet their life really doesn't change. Why? There are many who profess to follow Jesus Christ, and yet there seems to be so little change in their lives. What happened? We've all been given the same opportunity to become new creations in Christ Jesus, but uh, some of us who do, well, uh, we we tend to slip back into the same old sinful habits uh, that we tried to get away from. The sinful things that I did before I came to Christ, I'm still capable of doing today. And that old man that I'm trying to get away from still lives within me. And so, yes, I've been given a a new disposition in Christ Jesus, but if I'm not walking by faith in Christ Jesus, then I will be walking in the the old nature of my fallen man, and I will go back to the same old things that I used to do. And if you recognize how difficult this is and, and the struggle that's so real, Please pay attention to Paul's encouragement, which is found here in Colossians chapter 2. Look with me there at verse 6. Here Paul declares, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. In these verses, we find Paul encouraging those who have received Christ Jesus to now walk in Christ Jesus. The same faith that we placed in Jesus when we were born again, we have to continue walking in that faith. But now what does it mean to walk in Christ Jesus by faith? Well, With this question in mind, I want to consider the way that the New Living Translation renders Colossians 2 verse 6. Here's how they put it. And now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. You must continue to follow him. Christian, listen, conversion is just the beginning. Conversion brings us into Christ, but now that we're in Christ Jesus, we have to now walk in Christ Jesus, meaning we have to follow Jesus Christ. Those who are saved by faith must continue walking by faith in Jesus in order to enjoy the new disposition that we have in Christ Jesus so that we put the old man behind us and walk in the newness of life. And listen, this is a faith that will lead us into a life of obedience. I know that's not a word anybody wants to hear. But true faith will lead to true obedience. You really want to experience a changed life in this new year? Well, then I challenge you to walk in the obedience of faith. And one way that we do this is by making sure that we're not walking by sight. Remember, the Christian has been called to walk by faith, not by sight. So many of us are so quick to make decisions based on our sight. In other words, uh, our reasoning. You know, we, it's real easy to, to assess the world around us and look and see what's happening. And, oh, we can reason it all out. And we can make sense of it all. And we can make the best decisions. And be careful with all that. If it's not rooted in faith, then where is, it, where is it taking us? If we're making decisions based on our sight or based on our ability to reason from the things that we can see, I'm here to tell you there's no faith in that. Faith is saying, I'm going to walk by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to, I'm going to make the decisions that he's leading me to make so that I can go in the direction that he is leading me to go. And this brings us to our second point because, listen, Those who are new creations in Jesus Christ are not only provided with a new disposition 
you know, so that we have a new nature that helps us to make new decisions. But then as we begin to make these new decisions to walk by faith, the Lord begins to provide us with new directions. Now, in order to prove my point, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Here in Philippians 3, we find Paul presenting us with the new direction that every believer uh, receives from Jesus. And as you make your way to the third chapter of Philippians, I want to take a moment to consider the directional problems that many of us experience. Some of us are just directionally challenged. Some of us struggle, you know, even if we've been a certain route so many times, we can still get lost. And we have trouble following navigational directions. You know, uh, there are those, uh, you know, who recognize that uh, they, 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 they can't figure out how to get around a city they've been living in for years and years. Thankfully, you know, there are these new devices. You know, we have these phones that have GPS, you know, maps on it. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll, uh, we'll be smart enough to pull up the, the you know, the location that we want to go to and allow the, the, the GPS, you know, uh, system to give us turn-by-turn directions. That's always nice. But before we had all of that, you know, it, it, we have to stop and ask for directions, which most guys won't do. But, uh, but, but for, for me, it's not because I, I'm, I'm too proud to ask for instructions, but it's simply because, you know, I, I shut down after like the second turn. You, you know, once, once somebody says, well, you know, take a left at that thing and then and turn over on that street. And then, by that point in time, I'm done. I'm just gonna, I'm not going to remember any of this anyway, you know, so might as well just, you know, try to figure it out on my own. I guess I'm just not smart enough to, to keep all that information in my brain. Some of us, though, can't follow directions because it's just too, we're too proud. We're too proud to, to receive directions. We're too proud to receive instructions. Regardless of the reason for why it's difficult for us to follow directions, listen, it's even more difficult for us to follow spiritual directions, isn't it? Because, I mean, first of all, there's the figuring out what are the spiritual directions that we're receiving. But we struggle. We, we struggle to receive new spiritual directions from the Lord. We, we struggle to move forward according to those directions and, and for many different reasons. One reason is because we're afraid to fail. It's possible that the Lord is calling you to, to head in a new spiritual direction and, and you're so afraid to fail. And, and why? Well, because you're looking at the failures of the past. Well, I, I stepped up and served before, but I failed, so I can't step up and serve again. Well, I tried to have a devotional life before, but I failed, so I, I can't have a devotional life again. It, it just doesn't work for me. Well, I, you know, and, and we have these failures that happen in the past that keep us from receiving new directions for today to send us into the new direction of the future. And if this sounds like something that you struggle with, then I encourage you to check out what Paul writes here in Philippians chapter 3. Paul, you know, is, is being very candid here and confessing that he's not a perfect Christian yet, but he has a, 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 a solution for this. Look with me there at Philippians 3 verse 13. Here Paul declares, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended... But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul here is presenting us with a three-step plan for receiving new directions so that we can then follow them and arrive at the destination that God has determined for us. And the first thing that he does here, he says, hey, forget the failures of the past. Look again at verse 13. Paul says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. He's talking about, you know, being perfect, right? He hasn't apprehended a state of perfection yet. But the one thing that he does is this. He forgets those things which are behind. In other words, Paul was confessing here that while he hadn't achieved spiritual perfection yet, he was still able to receive new spiritual directions by simply forgetting about the mistakes of the past. And in light of his example, we must understand that the Christian who wants to experience the newness of life here in 2021, we must first choose to forget about all of the failures and all of the mistakes that we made last year and the year before and so on and so forth. If you are so focused on all the failures of your past, then you will inevitably head in the wrong direction. Let me prove my point. Imagine for a moment that you jumped into your car and your plans to drive from Austin to Dallas. You get in your car and you pull out of the driveway and head towards the highway. Next thing you know, 
you wreck into a tree. You, you completely wreck, you know, and, 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 and why? Why did you wreck your car? Well, because as you were driving down the road, the whole time you were just looking in the rearview mirror. Who would do that? Who would get in their car and attempt to head towards a destination, but instead of looking through the windshield, you're looking at the rear view mirror the whole time? We would think, how ridiculous. That person should have never received a driver's license like probably two-thirds of the drivers here in Austin. We all think it. Look, you can't make your way forward and head and arrive at the, at the new destination if you're busy focusing on the rear view mirror in a spiritual sort of way. You know, this is also true of our life when it comes to following the directions of the Lord. If the Lord is giving you new directions for this new year and you're busy looking out the spiritual rear view mirror of your life, then you can't head in the right direction. That's why Paul says, forget those things that are in the past. Listen, we all have a past. We've all made many mistakes. We've all blown it time and time again. And and I'm going to just agree with Paul. Yeah, I'm going to forget those things in the past. I'm going to forget those things in the past. I'm going to press forward. Look with me again here at this second step in in, in Paul's uh, instructions. In order to receive new directions and follow them, we must reach forward to those things which are ahead. It's verse 13. Paul tells us here that he was forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are where? That are ahead. Now, that word reach comes from a Greek word which speaks of stretching one's self forward towards something. And so Paul here, he's no longer focusing on the mistakes of the past. Instead, he's setting his sights on those things that God had in store for his future. He was reaching forward. Christian, listen, if you really want to experience the newness of life, then we must first receive the new direction that the Lord has for us. And in order to do this, we have to forget about the mistakes of the past. We have to forget about the mistakes we made in 2020 and all the years before. And in order to receive new directions from the Lord, we must focus where? Forward. And reach forward to those things that God has for us in the future. Therefore, we would all do well to just reach forward to the things which are still ahead. And not only was Paul forgetting the things in the past and reaching forward to those things which are still yet future tense, but he was also pressing towards a single goal. He was pressing towards the finish line of faith. Uh, Look with me again there at verse 13. Here again, Paul tells us that he was forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And then notice in verse 14. Paul declares, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He was pressing forward. He was pressing on. And it'll help us to understand that that word press, it refers to the act of running swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. He he was running swiftly forward. Towards what? Well, he was pressing toward the goal for the prize which is the upward call of God, where? In Christ Jesus. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we have a new disposition. And in Christ Jesus, we receive new directions. And so we ought to be swiftly running the race in order to reach forward to that goal of knowing Christ Jesus. Now, as we consider this new goal, which is the prize of the upward call of God, which is found in Christ Jesus, we must uh, take a moment to realize that, that every Christian has been given new directions to, 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 to move forward towards. And in order to better understand the new direction that we've been given in Christ, I want to sp- spend a moment just considering the, the football player who ends up being drafted to a, a, another team. This happens all the time. You know, a pro player uh, playing for one team can get drafted and, and end up on another team. And whenever a player changes teams, you know, inevitably they're going to end up playing against their former team. So, so a lot of times, you know, NFL players end up on a new team facing off against their old teammates and, and against their old coach. Now, imagine for a moment that the uh, NFL player on one team steps onto the field 
sets out to play against the old team, but then starts hearing instructions from their old coach. And they start running those plays in opposition of their new team. What kind of sense would that make? It wouldn't make any sense for a, a, a player to start receiving you know, the, the plays from the old coach. No, they need to help their new team win. They need to receive new directions from their new coach so that they can focus on the, the new goal line uh, that is for their new team. In a similar yet spiritual way, listen, every believer must remember, we've changed teams. When you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you changed teams. We used to play on Satan's team. You might not know that. But before we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we were on Satan's team. But now Christians are on Jesus' team, and therefore we have a new coach and a new team. Not only that, but we have a completely different goal line. The enemy is sending us towards the wrong goal line. And when a Christian begins to listen to the instructions of their old coach, they start running plays towards the wrong goal line again. We ought not do this. We need to receive new directions from our new coach so that we can continue moving forward with our new team towards our new goal line. Sadly, though, many Christians end up disregarding the new directions of Jesus Christ, and we start listening to the old directions of our former coach. And, and though we've become new creations in Christ Jesus, a lot of Christians end up wasting a whole lot of time scoring points for the wrong team. And if this sounds like you, then I'm encouraging you to receive the new spiritual directions of the Lord so that you can uh, forget about those things which are behind and reach forward to those things which are still yet ahead and press towards the right goal line. We need to press toward the right goal line, which is the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And one way that we do this is by keeping our focus on the correct destination. You see, uh, those who are new creations in Christ Jesus have not only been provided with a new disposition, which results in our personal growth, and we've not only received new directions, uh, which help us to to, to, to you know, focus on the right goal line. But what this means is that we've been provided with a brand new destination, uh, which is where we need to focus our attention. And with this in mind, if you would, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. You see, it's here in the 21st chapter of Revelation where the apostle John, he presents us with a little information about our new destination. And as you make your way to Revelation 21, I should point out that a destination, it's a predetermined end of a journey or a voyage. If you, if you go on a trip, chances are you've already picked a destination. Chances are either you're returning uh, from a Christmas vacation destination or you might still be in the midst of that, uh, of that trip. But before you left on this journey, you decided that you were going some certain place. You predetermined uh, a place that you were headed. You were going to go visit relatives or, or you were going you know, skiing or, or you were going on some sort of vacation. Wherever it was, you, know, you were determined to end up at that place. With that predetermined destination in mind, you got in your car or you got on a plane until you arrived at the, the previously determined destination. In a similar fashion, listen, the Lord has predetermined every person's final destination. You might not know that, but it's true. God has predetermined every person's final destination. Now, uh, there is an option, but there's only two places that we're all going to end up. We're all either going to end up in heaven or we're going to end up in hell. There's no third option. There's no other place, you know, like the Bahamas or something, you know. It's, no, you're either going to end up in heaven or you're going to end up in hell. You're going to either end up in the kingdom of God or you're going to be sent to the place where unbelievers are punished forevermore. This, the, these destinations have already been determined but it's your choice where you end up. And while the unrepentant unbeliever will end up in hell where they will suffer for every sin they've ever committed, the believer who trusts in Jesus Christ has received a different destination. The believer who trusts in Jesus Christ has not only received a new disposition, we've not only received 
new directions, but we've received a new destination. And that destination is heaven. Now, heaven is hard to get our minds around. I mean, heaven is this place that, you know, is probably beyond our imagination. But thankfully for us, there, there is this little aspect of, of, of what it might be like, at least for a thousand years here on the earth. As, and John helps us to understand this by describing the new Jerusalem, which will come out of heaven and, and land upon a refurbished earth, and it will be here for a thousand years. And, and, and so this gives us a little glimpse, a little taste of what heaven is going to be like. And with this as our focus, I'd like you to look with me here at Revelation chapter 21, uh, where we get a little glimpse of our new destination. Look with me there, beginning at verse 1. Here John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Here in these verses, we find John, he's telling us about this vision that he saw, this prophetic vision about this new Jerusalem made by the one who makes all things new. The Lord is going to make all things new, beginning with a new heaven and a new earth. Now, the heaven and the earth that we currently see are, are beautiful indeed. And yet we must remember that the entire creation was affected by the fall of Adam. And as a result, uh, the, the, the creation was cursed. Thankfully, the Lord is going to recreate heaven. He's going to refurbish earth so that we can enjoy a curse-free creation just as the Lord originally intended. He's going to make all things new. And not only will there be a new heaven and a new earth, but there's going to be this new Jerusalem, this, this heavenly city that comes down to the earth. And, and it's here in uh, Revelation 21, verse 2, where John declares, I saw uh, the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John helps us to see how there's going to be this new Jerusalem on this new earth. And, and as it descends to the new creation, it's going to look like this beautiful bride adorned for her uh, wedding day. And there in that new city, the, the God uh, of heaven and earth is going to dwell with his people and we're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. And not only did John see this new heaven and this new earth and a new Jerusalem, but, but he saw the way that every person has then become fully new creations, which the Lord uh, wants us to become. Notice again there in verse 4. There John tells us that God is going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. I have no doubt that we've all wept tears throughout this past year. But in the new Jerusalem, no more tears. Those who enter the new creation of God will leave the trouble and tears of the former world behind. Isn't that incredible? Not only that, but John also revealed that there will be no more death. No one's going to die in the new Jerusalem. There's not going to be any sorrow, he says. There's not going to be anyone crying. The troubles of this world will be gone as we enter into the new creation. John assures us there will be no more pain for the former things have passed away. In other words, in the new creation, those who are in Christ Jesus will never suffer again. From this, it's important to remember that this earth, as it is today, is not our home. We must always remember that the new heaven and the new earth, this is the home that the Lord wants to prepare for us. And, and therefore, uh, how much time and energy should we spend here in this world building an earthly kingdom? How much time and energy should we invest in a kingdom which will eventually be burned up 
when the earth is refurbished. Listen, as we enter into this new year, it's crucial for Christians to realize that we haven't been called to store up our treasures here on earth with the hopes of experiencing a little bit of heaven here on earth. We should begin this new year remembering that we're just passing through, we're just on a journey here. You know, if you go out on a trip, you plan on going camping, you know, you don't take your house with you. You take a little portable tent, it's just a little, you know, quick journey, you set it up and you plan on tearing it down in a couple of days. It's just a little trip. And that's how we ought to be passing through this life, recognizing, eh, this, this is just a temporary tent, you know, won't be long before it's gone. So what truly is important in 2021? We're looking for a heavenly home in which righteousness dwells and with this new destination in sight, let's remember that, that the Lord isn't calling us to set up a kingdom for ourselves here in this world. Instead, the Lord is calling us to live for him. In order to explain what I mean by this, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to consider something that Peter writes here in the third chapter of his second epistle. As you make your way to 2 Peter 3, I just want to take a moment to consider the, the way that, you know, we took some time when we moved into this facility to renovate this space that we're currently in. You know, we moved into this location, uh, you know, uh, I guess, what was it, 2012, I think it was. But, uh, but you know, th when we got here, you know, there had been several churches in here before us. Uh, this, this facility has actually been a church for many, many years. I think there were at least two churches in here before us. And when we got here, you know, uh, the facility was... And I want to be polite about it. Um, it was dated. It was dated. The carpet was cash money green, you know, because there was some charismatic stuff going on in here. And, you know, the drapes were royal purple because that's the way Jesus wants the church. And, uh, and let's just say the conditions were long overdue for a makeover, okay? And thankfully, the Lord provided us with everything we need to, to, to transform our facility so that we could have a, a church that is, you know, completely renovated. We did, we did the bathrooms. We, we redid all the rooms and, you know, new carpet, new paint, all these sorts of things, right? And, and, and all of this just to, to have a, a nice place to, to come and worship the Lord, Right? But as we consider the transformation that happened here in this facility, we should also realize, uh, you know, that, that, that the Lord is doing something similar in the life of every person today. Uh, there's, a, there's a temporary restoration, if you will, that's happening in our lives. And yet at the end of the day, listen, it's not like when Jesus returns, he's going to be like, you know, you know, the Christians worked so hard on that CSA renovation that let's just keep that church here in, in the new earth. No. As hard as we worked on this facility, and I know that some of you guys worked harder than, uh, th than I could even imagine, uh, I, you know, I'm here to tell you, it's all going to burn up. Sorry. <laughs> all the hard work we put into this, it's going to burn. It's going to burn. Why? Because the Lord's preparing a, a new destination for us. And, and so all the earthly work that, that we put into changing our lives according to what we think is the right way to go, uh, all that's going to disappear when we receive a brand new body in the resurrection. The Lord is going to turn us into new creations entirely. Our soul, our, 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 our body, our spirit, everything is going to be uh, renewed. It's going to be incredible. And with that being the case, how should we be living today? Knowing that he's going to take the kingdom that we tried to build here on earth and just burn it all up. <laughs> what kind of time should we spend building our own kingdom? With all this in mind, let's consider what Peter is saying here in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, look with me there beginning at verse 11. Here Peter says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire? and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Now, here in these verses, the, the apostle Peter, 
he poses a very important question that I believe we all ought to ask of ourselves. And the question I'm referring to is found there in verse 11. And there again, Peter declares, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? In other words, since all this stuff is going to get burned up, how should we be living our lives then? What really should we be investing in? You know, how should we be conducting ourselves? And according to Peter here, well, we ought to be living in a holy and a godly way. But now, how do we maintain this walk, and how do we go about living in a holy and a godly way? Well, with this question in mind, let's consider what Peter wrote next. There in verse 12, he says that we ought to be looking for and hastening. What? Not the coming of the new year, but the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Those of us who are new creations in Christ Jesus ought to have a new focus as we set out to walk in holiness and godliness. And the way we do this is by looking forward, pressing forward, reaching forward to what day? The day of God. The day of God when all this gets burned up and refurbished. Now, it's easy for us to start focusing in on everything that needs to happen here in this world. It's so easy. I mean, the minute we wake up, it's just like, oh, I've got this long running list of things that have to be done today. You know, I've got, I've got, you know, I've got a plan for the future. I've got to make sure I've got savings. I've got to make, you know, we, we start making all these plans for this world, for this journey, for this camping excursion, if you will. And we can get so caught up in, in all of the drama of today that we start forgetting we're new creations in Christ Jesus who are just passing through this planet. So if you really want to experience newness of life in this new year, make sure that you're setting your sight on the right finish line. Make sure that you're looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And with this as the goal, it's important to remember the prophetic promises of Jesus. Let's consider again how Peter puts it here in 2 Peter chapter 3. Look with me there at verse 13. Here Peter declares, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The apostle Peter encouraged every Christian to look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus will refurbish the entire creation because it's at that point in time when true righteousness will be established here on earth. Christian, listen, true righteousness is not going to be established on January the 6th. True righteousness is not going to be established on January the 20th. True righteousness is not going to be established in four years. There's not coming a day, politically speaking, when we're going to have all the right leaders in place so that finally, yay, you know, true righteousness is here. Listen, both parties are so completely corrupt right now that it would just take a complete refurbishing of the entire planet to work it all out. And if your hope is in January the 6th or January the 20th or four years from now when it all gets worked out, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Now, I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't be a part of the political process. I love all that stuff. I'm just letting you know, if that's where your hope is and if you think that's where the finish line is and we're finally gonna get there, it ain't gonna happen. Proper understanding of the scriptures will lead you to understand that things are just gonna get worse and worse and worse as the mystery of lawlessness continues to play out until the rise of the Antichrist. And he ain't gonna make it better. So let's get our focus straight. You know, I know Christians who are so completely invested in, in what's going on politically here in this world that they're forgetting that the finish line is well beyond January the 6th or the 20th or what have you. We need to look forward according to the promise of Jesus Christ for the day when true righteousness will finally be established on this planet. And when is that? When Jesus Christ returns and becomes the king of kings over this planet and rules and reigns with a rod of iron. Until then, there won't be true righteousness here. And this can cause us to begin to lose heart and we can begin, become stressed out because things aren't going the way we want them to go. Well, how do you know this isn't the way that God wants it to go? What is he doing to set the, this world up for the Antichrist? He knows what he's doing. 
My job is to look forward to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells according to the promises that he's made. Let me give you one of those promises. It's in uh, John chapter uh, uh, 14. It's in John 14 where Jesus declared, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Incredible promise. That's, that's where my focus is. Come, Lord Jesus, come. This is a promise that the Lord Jesus made that he has gone to prepare a place for those who trust in him. And as we consider this prophetic promise, uh, we can see that there's this day when Jesus is going to receive us to himself. I believe that this is a reference to the rapture of the church, which is going to occur uh, on the day when Jesus catches us away to meet him in the air. And we will go and hang out in the new Jerusalem there in heaven for, for the following you know, seven years until it drops down like a bride coming to, uh, for the wedding day. I get it. It's easy for us to lose heart when we look at the world around us, when we look at the the way things are going, when we look at the mystery of lawlessness and how bad things are getting. It's easy to lose heart. Unless you're focused on the future. Unless you're looking forward to the rapture of the church, then you'll enjoy the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, knowing that this ain't the end. Let's consider how Peter puts it here in 2 Peter chapter 3. Look with me again, beginning at verse 14. There the apostle declares, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Peter here is helping his audience to understand that the Christian who is focused on our new destination will then be diligent to walk in the peace that surpasses all understanding. If you're looking forward to what? To the rapture of the church, then you will be diligent to be found by him in peace and without spot. I don't know where spot went, uh, but apparently no dogs in heaven, sorry. But, but, But seriously, if we would just focus on the finish line, we would be found by him in peace and without spot, meaning stain of sin blameless in the eyes of our Savior. With this as the goal, we should take a moment to examine our own lives. We ought to ask, are we new creations who are focused on the new destination that the Lord is preparing for us, or have we become backsliding believers who have focused all of our attention on the things of this world? Are we focusing all of our energy on the kingdom that we're trying to build for ourselves here on earth? Or are we looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God when the heavens will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat because on that day, the Lord is going to establish true righteousness on the new earth. Chances are many of us have been wavering in our walk with the Lord. You know, 2020 was a tough year. And I have no doubt that many of us have wavered in our faith. And if this sounds like your struggle, then I encourage you to begin this year with a new focus on the new destination that the Lord is preparing for us. Without debate, I I have no doubt that we're all hoping that this year is going to be better than 2020. You might be thinking, how could it get any worse? Listen, I can't promise that the circumstances of 2021 will improve. And if I understand the scriptures properly, chances are it's going to get worse. But here's what I can assure you of this morning, that those who are new creations in Christ Jesus can continue in this new year to become those believers who are walking in the newness of life no matter what's happening here in this world. Even if everything's falling apart around us, We can still be those new creations in Christ Jesus who are experiencing complete peace and the joy that we have in Jesus, no matter what's happening around us. With that being the case, I encourage you to remember that those who are new creations in Christ Jesus have a new disposition which results in personal growth 
as the Lord leads us forward. Those who are new creations in Christ Jesus can then follow the new directions that are leading us to the brand new goal line, that destination, that new destination that we receive in Christ Jesus. And so therefore new creations can walk in peace knowing that this new destination is being prepared for us even today. And there's coming a day, hopefully sooner rather than later, when the Lord will receive us to himself. And with that being the case, I close by encouraging every Christian, let's keep our focus on Jesus. If you're going to make one resolution for this new year, let it be this, that you resolve to focus on Jesus and walk by faith with him. And as we do, we'll embrace the benefits of the new disposition, the, the, the new direction, and the new destination that we have in Christ Jesus. And as we continue to walk in the obedience of faith, following Jesus Christ, we will continually be renewed day by day and from grace to grace as the Lord continues to help us daily to put on the new man, which is created in true righteousness and holiness. And in this way, every believer will continue to become new and improved as we walk with Jesus Christ throughout this brand new year. Let's pray.